Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, G. and Tomasi and Webster, M&T Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Eric Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orphanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American and these friends. Duck farmer. What's a duck farmer? A duck farmer who becomes a school teacher. A school teacher becomes a banker? He doesn't become a banker. He becomes a legendary banker. He creates a $60 billion bank, sells it to Capital One, and says, you know, I'm too young to retire. Then he buys another bank, and now he's the second largest bank in the state of Florida and also in New York City. I'm lucky to have John Cannon today. Thanks for being here. Good to see you, Michael. So let's talk about your grandparents. You were telling me your father's side came from Poland and Australia? Austria. Austria. Yeah, yeah. My uh, grandmother, my father's mother was uh, from Poland, and his father was from Austria. And you're uh, on the other side of the family? Italian, both uh, from uh, around Naples someplace. Right. And then you said to me, so how did your uh, father's, uh, your mother's side come here? They, they were the ones who ended up in the, in the farming business, right? My father's side ended up in the farming business. They, they came here. Uh, he immigrated from uh, Trieste in, in the uh, early teens, went right, to, uh, went right to Pennsylvania, where a lot of Eastern Euro European men who had no money and no language skills and uh, no education went to mine coal and lasted there for about 10 years until he got black lung disease and nearly died. And then uh, somehow ended up back on Long Island, and I'm still not sure how, but there was a network of uh, Austrian and Polish people that were forming on Long Island, and he made his way back there to become a laborer on, uh, on a neighboring farm. And that was the beginning of it. But you said to me before that they were in Harlem, right? My grand, m my, my mother's parents, uh, lived in Harlem. They, they were uh, the ones who came from Italy. They moved to, uh, they spent many years in Harlem when, when Harlem, I guess, was uh, uh, before my time, obviously, but when uh, Harlem was largely Italian and Irish, uh, and uh, he was in the, uh, he was in hardware business in, uh, in Harlem, and he moved out to eastern Long Island. And then he became the a politician. He was a politician. And then a the farmer and then a real estate investor, you said. Yeah, he was a big real estate investor. Uh, real estate, he was there in the 30s when things were very, very cheap. He bought, uh, he, he owned half of Dune Road in West Hampton Beach when he probably bought it for all for $10,000. It's worth uh, $10 million, $100, $100 million. Today. So then tell me about your, your parents, how they meet. My parents met, uh, my father uh, uh, was a laborer on his father's farm, and my mother uh, lived in the neighboring town. and. Uh, they met uh, socially. My uh, one of the businesses my grandfather had was a restaurant in Eastport, and uh, they both went there. She worked there actually. She uh, she was a waitress, and he went there to eat a hamburger and have a glass of beer one night, and uh, and met met his wife Barbara Matola, and uh, and they got married. I guess 1942. Now you you were born in 1946, and you said uh, 
um, growing up, you literally were living in a farm. I mean, this sure. duck farm, which you happen to live there today, right? I do. I, I live in my grandfather's house uh, on the farm. Actually, it's a house he built in 1930, 1931. Um, and, and many of the old buildings that, that, that he used to operate the farm are still on the property. So we, I, I every day drive down my driveway and drive past uh, some of the old buildings where my father worked and he worked and I worked as a kid. Actually, one of the buildings, I, for, I, 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 I always forget this, one of the buildings, which is today just a, is vacant, is a small building about 600 square feet with uh, two rooms. And it is the only building that was on the property it was the first building he built, and it's where he and his wife lived and raised six children in a 600-square-foot room, basically, with a, uh, with a coal stove. So. so talk to me. Now, you said to me, you, you go to public school, I mean big public school. How many, how many kids were in your graduating class in, when you graduated in, public school? In eighth grade, nine people, and in high school, 32. 32 was the biggest graduating class we ever had. And, and, and by the way, that was a regional high school. Now, what was interesting about when you were going to high school and public school is that you carried a shotgun and yeah. you would, and you would uh, okay, you know, you would uh, shoot uh, pheasants? It's hard for people to understand what life on Eastern Long Island was like when I was a kid. We you kid about duck farms. There was, there was 100 duck farms on Eastern Long Island. And they were vegetable farms and they were grain farms. And they were, it was a very agricultural community. And we lived in the woods. And, and yeah, I, I walked... I would walk to school in the morning, which was maybe 1,500 feet from my house, and carry my 410 shotgun, prop it up in the corner of a classroom, and then when I, at the end of the school day, when it was time to go home, I hunted the fields between the school and my house to try to shoot a pheasant on the way home for, uh, uh, to, to give to my mother to cook. Now, you said to me, you, you, you came to New York City because your dad had polio when he was yeah. young. And your grandfather really took care of the support of the family, yeah. right? My, my father uh, fell victim to polio in 1950 when polio was at, at ep epidemic uh, pro proportions. And uh, I was four, but I, I, I do remember coming to New York. And at the time, uh, the polio hospital in New York was the hospital for special surgery. It was uh, uh, referred to as, uh, um, in children, the hospital for uh, infantile paralysis. and. Uh, I came here visit him. He was here in the hospital for about a year, and then uh, uh, rehabilitating at home for several years. Couldn't walk for about three years. So, so you graduated high school, and, and as you said to me, uh, you weren't the best student, and you no. weren't sure of what you wanted to do. And I think one of your relatives said, "Hey, join the army because it'll save some money, right?" Actually, my my high school advisor oh, oh, that was called me in one day, and and he was sort of curious as to what I might do, and. He sat down and said, what do you think about doing it? And I told him I'd like to go to college. And he looked at me, and, and, and I knew it, it was painful for him to make the next statement. He said, you know, I know your family. You don't have any money, and, and your folks have all worked very hard. He said, do you ever think about the Army? <laughs> I so, said, no, I really didn't. So um, uh, that was a challenge. So, so you decide to go to... Uh C.W. Post, Southampton College. Southampton uh, College. Okay, you, I mean, because, you know, you couldn't leave the farm. And you go over there and you study, what, you, you were studying history, right? I studied history and English uh, with a minor in philosophy. It, it prepared me very well for the banking. So, right, <laughs> so, so what happens now is, you know, you graduate college and you really have no idea what you're going to do. You could have been a duck farmer, but... Uh, and. Uh, what we had, as I was saying to you when we got together, is we both had similarities because there was a way to possibly omit going to Vietnam. Yeah. It was becoming a school teacher or becoming a reservist. And yeah. You took the opportunity to become a school teacher. That's right. That's right. I taught, uh, I taught in the Patchogue Public Schools. I had student taught in 1967 and went right into, at the time, jobs were easy to come by in teaching. So I had my pick of any 10 jobs that I wanted to in the Patchogue School District. Uh, so I taught uh, middle school for um, three years until I got tenure. And, but l let's talk about, you know, the, the one day you're in the hardware store and something happens. Yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I, I told you at the end of uh, my teaching career, I got drafted anyway. And uh, You go down to Whitehall Street? I went down to Whitehall Street like we all went on a bus at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and walked around naked all day, and, and uh, at the end of the day, found out that uh, I was declared uh, uh, 
four F, I think, was the was the classification. I had broken my leg in football in college, my knee, and I really couldn't get around very well. It was swollen, and uh, so anyway, uh, 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 the draft wasn't an issue anymore. I decided to go to law school, which was what I always thought maybe I would do. So during the summer of 1970, I guess, while I was waiting to go to law school, I had the summer off, and I was in a hardware store in my hometown. And an older friend of mine tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, listen, he said, what are you doing Monday? This is a, f a Saturday. I said, what are you doing Monday? He said, nothing. I said, I'm, I'm waiting to go to law school in the fall, and really didn't doing anything, going on my boat, going to the beach. He said, would you drive me to Mattituck? And Mattituck was 30 miles from my house. I had never been to Mattituck. It was way out on the North Fork of Long Island. He had written a hundred different letters to banks all over the country trying to get a bank to put a branch in our town where I lived in East Mauritius because he claimed it was the largest town in Suffolk County without a bank. He probably made that up, but he claimed it anyway. So I said, sure, and picked him up Monday at 11 o'clock and drove him out to Mattituck and sat by uh, and witnessed a conversation between him and a fellow who was the president of North Fork Bank at the time. Which was originally the origin started in 1850, you know. Oh, yeah, it went way back. Yeah. And, and then it was, uh, there was a, a small merger. Merger going between to Kutchog Bank. Kutchog Bank, South Hole Bank, and Greenport Bank. Greenport Bank. So they shake hands on a deal, and, and we're about to leave, and the gentleman who's the president of the bank turns his attention to me. And he said, who are you? I said, I'm his driver. I drove him out here. He's too old to drive. He said, what do you do? And I explained, I was a teacher on my way to law school. He said, you know, you really ought to think about banking as a career. Why don't you, uh, he said, you live in that town. He said, we'll train you to be a banker. And he said, we could offer you a very nice deal. Right. Uh, he offered you 7000 and you were making 15000 Yeah, he offered me $7,000. And I said, no, it's, no, thank you. I'm going to law school. I go home. The, ho the phone rings a week later. The same fellow calls me back. He said, you know, we feel terrible about what we offered you. We, we think we, were all, we shortchanged you. And... We had a board meeting to talk about this. And uh, would, you, would you come back out here? We really want to make you another proposal. So I thought, this must be good. These guys check me out. They want to pay me a lot of money. I drive back out 30 miles. And uh, he said, we want to raise the offer to 7,500. <laughs> I said, uh, no. And for some reason, and I don't know why, I, on the way out the door, I said, by the way, would you, uh, would you pay the tuition for a graduate school education in business? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, would, would you pay for an MBA? He said, what's an MBA? And I explained that it was just a business degree. And he said, yeah, I think we would do that. So I took the job uh, because I wanted to get an MBA as well, and I had no money. And so I thought I could make $7,500 a year, get my MBA at CW Post, which is where I enrolled the next month, and in a year and a half or two years, I'd have it done, and then I could go to law school. But your job, the original job, was really to be a deposit gatherer to open up this first branch, right, in East Mauritius. Oh, yeah, in East Mauritius. Oh, I, oh, yeah, they trained me to be a teller. They trained me to open accounts. They trained me to open the vault. You know, I mean, the, but I, I probably have done every conceivable job you could think of in a bank, including be auditor and be a lender and be a marketing guy. Right. I, I remember you told me about one of the first loans you did also, you know, uh, the, yeah. the golf course with we the 25 a, guarantees. The I, did, I did a $500,000 loan to a local golf course in, uh, in Manorville, Rock Hill Country Club, still there today. Thank God it was a good loan. And it, it was the first loan I brought to North Fork. And, and I remember the mouths all dropped because it was the biggest loan they had ever seen. And I didn't know what I was doing, except I knew the people who were borrowing the money. So it was a, a, a nice start. So you, then you opened up a couple more branches, and you yep. uh, and and then one day uh, you were uh, you got a phone call from a uh, banker at uh, at uh, C Citibank was thinking of opening up in Suffolk County and uh, Peter Fudge uh, yep, Peter. and he and he and he heard about this kid Canis. And what happened? He, he asked me if I'd be interested in in uh, running Citibank's Long Island operation, which never even had occurred to me because I was thinking about getting out of the banking business by then. But I was successful, and we had opened by then five or six branches on the South Fork, and they were doing very well. And you were telling me you were, you were opening them in the, in the, in the SAFRA tradition with TVs and other yes. and radios. Yes. And whatever way. We, Giving away clocks and clocks, uh, right. yeah, 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 pressure cookers. You know. So um, I went for an interview, and uh, 
I, I, by then I was making $18,000 a year, which was big money. And the, the Citibank job paid 35, which I couldn't believe it. It was incredible. So I said, you know what? Let me take the test. So they gave me a test and I passed the test and they interviewed me. I, five or six people interviewed me. The process went on for three or four weeks. And uh, finally one Friday, he called me and said, look, we've waited long enough. You can take the job, yes or no. We need to know by Monday morning. And then you get a phone call from uh, somebody, right? What happens? Sunday night, I'm having dinner. The phone rings, and it was the president of the bank's wife. And she said, listen, we were at a, uh, we were at a family wedding in Utica, New York, and Ed got sick during the, uh, during the uh, reception. And he's in the hospital. He's got to get a few tests. So he said, she said, he asked me to ask you, would you do a few things for him on Monday? Would you do this and would you do that? And on Tuesday morning, would you do that? And on Wednesday, we have a meeting and would you take the meeting? And of course I said, yeah, the guy's sick. And I remember hanging up the phone saying, well, there goes the Citibank idea because I'm certainly not gonna call him up in the hospital and telling him, tell him that I quit. So I called Citibank and said, uh, no. And uh, that was 19, probably 1974. Right, and, but uh, Ed, unfortunately, wasn't healthy, and Ed uh, subsequently died of bladder cancer. Yeah, he, he uh, unfortunately, it turned into a, 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 a terrible disease, and uh, he fought it for uh, two years, but never really was able to come back full-time. To uh, to so, so then the board of directors of this bank said, hey, we've got to have a, an acting president, right? Board, the board chairman, uh, Irving Price, who, who was, you know, we all have people in our lives that, reach out and grab us and help. Irving Price was one of those people for me. Walked in my office and he said, look, we, we need to uh, find a president for this bank and the board is gonna hire a headhunting firm and it's gonna take six months. So will you, would you sort of run the bank for us for a while, while we do this? Because I was too young to be considered for the job. 27, 28 years old. And uh, so of course, and I, I honestly, I remember him saying, so, well, you know, you know how to open the vault and you know how to get it. But sort of, I was the kid who knew you know, sort of a little bit about everything around the bank. And as you know, boards are, they weren't under any pressure then to find anybody quickly. A month went by and six months went by and almost a year went by. And they, they, got, a, they got a letter from the Secretary of State in New York and said, listen, you can't have a New York State Corporation without a president. So you either have to make this guy president or you have to make somebody president and which led to a big board meeting and... Uh, and you lucked, it was 10 to two. The it was 10 to two. 10 to two, and two, right. so, so now the, the kid who was the duck farmer becomes the president of a 20, uh, at 29 years of age, right? In 76, yeah, that's right. So you become, uh, so what happens next? The, the bank uh, grows a little bit. The bank did very well. Um, it, the bank was uh, not fully a public company when I became president, it was traded out of the pink sheets. So the local barber would call me and tell me he wanted to sell 100 shares and the local lawyer would, uh, I would match up buyers and sell it. Can't do that much anymore. Um, so by, by 1981, uh, we had grown substantially. The and, bank was probably... Is that when uh, the people from Lost Star came to you and they wanted to take over the bank? Actually, a little bit before that. Uh, shortly after I was made president, Peter Kiernan called me, who I had always admired. I thought he was one of the great personalities in banking. He and Victor Riley in those days, he was Key Bank and, uh, and, and Peter was uh, North Star Bank. And uh, North Star had been buying up all the bank, small bank franchises on Long Island and he, he asked me to uh, sell him or to, be, to recommend selling North Fork to him and to run all of Long Island uh, for, uh, for North Star Bank. And I had just been, been made president, it seemed like a very short, I'd have a very short tenure. We had a big discussion at the board about it. And uh, fortunately the board uh, voted uh, to take my recommendation, which was to not sell the company. So uh, uh, I almost had a very short banking career. So in the, in the early 80s, you, you, you tried, and since you were, you were experienced, you really didn't know Wall Street too much. You, you went down to uh, Wall Street in like 1982, and then you yeah. met the Mickey Siebert, and she said, uh, kid, you can't find uh, anybody to get you some money. Go to see those guys at LF. The legendary, the legendary Mickey Siebert, who, uh, who I always will have fond memories of. She was uh, superintendent of banks in New York, and she'd called me in to, uh, I think, wring my neck because we were running 
at about 4% capital and, uh, and, and they were pounding the table saying you need to do something or we're going to come in and you know, really give you a hard time. And I, and I had uh, tried to raise capital, probably kicked out of the 20 or 30 different investment banks. But we only needed $10 million and nobody wanted to fool with a deal that size. And she picked up the phone. I said, Mickey, you've been on Wall Street your whole life. You must know somebody who could raise 10 million bucks for me. And she picked up the phone and she, at the time her office was in the World Trade Center. She hangs up, she said, do you know where Water Street is? I said, no. She said, well, she went out to her window. She said, go out here and walk across Lower Manhattan to 55 Water Street where I went and I met uh, Bob Tobin and Tom Unterberg who ran a firm called L.F. Rothschild, Unterberg and Tobin. And on the spot, within about 10 minutes, they agreed to do a public offering and raise the $10 million that I did. And that, uh, that was the beginning of, of really taking North Fork public. And then you did another thing, uh, secondary. Did a secondary, the, the secondary. We did a secondary in uh, 19. We, we barely squeezed out book value in that IPO. Uh, and then by 1986, we did a secondary, which was twice the size of the IPO, and we sold that at two times book. So right. we had to... Uh, but 1989 was a little tough for you guys, right? No, no, no. 1989 was not a little tough. 1989 was almost the end of my banking career for the second time. Uh, then you could have gone back to teaching. I could have gone I back mean, to teaching. I mean, it would have yeah. been that. Yeah. So uh, 1989, and uh, but you made some wise decisions at that time. And you said, I'd rather get 30 cents on a dollar as opposed to 5 cents yeah. or be com completely out of business. The bank had been making what today would be called speculative real estate loans for 20 years successfully land development loans because Suffolk County was growing rapidly and the market was very healthy for like 19 years and until it wasn't and one day in 1989 uh, the music stopped and the bank got stuck with a lot of undeveloped real estate uh, we saw it coming a little bit sooner than other banks because the result of that was there were seven good-sized bank failures on Long Island in that two or three year period and we started auctioning real estate off that we took back in foreclosure and getting, you know, 20, 30, 40 cents on the dollar. And it was a subject of great, uh, I was a subject of great criticism because people, people said we were ruining the market, driving prices down further. And uh, in retrospect, it's what allowed us to survive because a year later, those loans and that real estate was worth less than 10 cents on the dollar. And had we waited, uh, the bank, most likely wouldn't have survived. We were we were that close. So it was really 1990 that you decided that since you didn't know where Water Street was and you really didn't know much about Manhattan, you, you really came to New York and you started with Eastchester, right? Yeah, 1991. We 19 bought, uh, bought Eastchester Savings Bank. It's very funny. I just this morning had breakfast with Derek Cephas, who was then the superintendent of banks in New York when, when I got in trouble in 1989 and 90. And... Uh, and, and but for the fact that Eric, uh, that Derek knew me and trusted me as, as a as a person, um, uh, we could have very well washed out of the business. Uh, but yeah, we we bought uh, Eastchester Savings Bank in in 1991, which was a weakened bank itself, and we were a weak bank. But we had convinced the regulators that by combining the two institutions that we, we, there was a higher likelihood that we would both survive. And, and then you decided to, you know, when you came into New York City in what, 94 really? Uh, 96. 96, okay. 96, but, 97 but, but in then a you, way. I mean, you bought Bayside Federal, you bought a couple of Home Federal, you bought uh, Freddie Gould's Bank of Great Neck, yep. uh, and uh, 1996, how did you decide to make the decision to plunge well, into the apple? We, we really didn't. We, we actually had no interest in Manhattan at all. And by 1997, actually. We bought a little bank on uh, uh, out in Suffolk County called Exte Bank. It was owned by the Spanish government, uh, and they had a very nice Suffolk County franchise. And for some reason, they had one branch. One I branch. remember the branch in New York City, thirty-seven uh, on, on the corner of thirty-seven and six. Yeah. So, um, and y you have to think back to that time. People's memories of the failure of Security National Bank and Franklin National Bank. Were, were indelibly ingrained in their mind. And those banks were, some people thought that had they not gone into New York City and started expanding, they'd probably not have failed. So people were very reticent to think that a, a Suffolk County bank could go to New York and survive. So our first inclination was to, to close that one branch that we had in Manhattan. And so while we were busy, you know, restructuring the, the Suffolk County franchise, I instructed our people to close the, 
the branch in Manhattan. And uh, because it wasn't an urgent thing to do, uh, six or seven months went by before we got it closed. And before we closed it, the person who ran retail banking came in and said, you know, I, I just need to tell you something. You know, when we bought Exeter Bank and we bought that branch in New York, it was $28 million in deposits. And she said, while we've been thinking about closing it, and he, she said, we really haven't even painted the place. It's terrible. She said, now it's $58 million. And all we did is, is uh, open the drapes and let the air into the room. Gave away the clock saucer? Gave away clocks okay. and had a couple I, I parties. Mean, I think he, okay. nothing, nothing extravagant. Right. And uh, so it got my attention. And uh, we started to look at the market in New York. And that was at the time when there were, were some fairly good size uh, consolidations. Manufacturers Hanover, Chemical Bank, Republic Bank, uh, all of those were merging into it, it, those banks into, uh, into Chase. There was uh, 180 or so branches of those banks that were closed in the year before. So it looked like there might, in fact, be an opportunity for a small bank to do uh, business in New York City. So you, you did that, then you went to New Jersey, then the big, the big acquisition was in 2004 when you took over Greenpoint, Green, which really put you on a national scale because of the, yes. the mortgage. So 2006, 365 branches, $60 billion in deposits, right. decide to sell to this credit card company called right. Capital One who wanted to get really into the banking. And you stay there for a period of time and then you do a little consulting. What happens in uh, 2007, in uh, 2009? A little bank idea? <laughs> by, by the middle of 2007, my wife got tired of watching me rearrange her closets uh, in the in the kitchen, suggested I go out and find a job. So I, I went to see an old friend of mine, Wilbur Ross, who I had known for many, many years. And uh, it, and it, it was beginning to look to me like banking was going to get pretty rough and pretty distressed. And Wilbur, as you know, has a reputation in the distressed area. He likes distress. Likes right. distress. So I went to see Wilbur. And I said, you know what? I know something about banking, and you know something about distressed assets, and I think... I think those things are going to merge in the next couple of years. Why don't we uh, combine our resources? And so Wilbur and I, on a handshake, uh, started a partnership, and I became his sort of in-house bank guy and started wandering around the United States looking for potential investments for W.L. Ross's fund. Right. In 2009, you, Wilbur, and a consortium, Serbia, uh, you know, Blackstone, and some yep. other people buy they failed Bank United. Yeah, Bank United was, uh, was uh, 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 at one time, you know, a very nice little, not so little, bank centered in Miami-Dade County uh, in, in South Florida uh, and fell under very hard times. They were a, uh, they were a residential mortgage originator and right. they, they really, they really, they, they really specialize in the pick-a-pay. Uh, and, you, and you've turned that around and you're now a $14 billion bank. Right. right. Okay. Right. With no seconds left, talk to me. You're married. You marry your wife. I am. I'm married. I have uh, three, four children. I have uh, uh, three older children, and, and my youngest is 21. He's about to graduate from college, and uh, uh, in a couple of weeks, and uh, we're anxious to go up and watch. So you know, it's it's good that the duck farmer left the duck farm and became a legendary banker. And I'd like to thank you for being here today. Great country, America. Thank you.